So welcome to your prenatal development lecture online. This PowerPoint is aimed at helping you understand the basics of 10 major content area I wanted to highlight in chapter two. So hopefully this will make reading the chapter much more efficiently and effectively. Let's get started. So let's begin by talking about the first steps in making an individual human being. At conception, a sperm fertilizes an ovum after moving from the vagina through the cervix, through the uterus, and that ends up meeting the ovum in the fallopian tube. This is when they form a zygote. What's really unique about the sperm and the ovum is that they are the only cells in the human body that contains 23 single unpaired chromosome, half of the 46 all other cells contain. This is why we get half of the genetic information from the father's sperm and the other half from the mother's ovum. For more detailed information on the process of conception, please refer to your textbook um, on page 30 to 32 and then 35 to 39. This is a good refresher on high school biology. And there's also links that I'm including on this slide and on Canvas to two videos that would help get a better grasp on prenatal development in general, but specifically brain development. Genetics is a fascinating thing. For instance, have you ever wondered why siblings can be so different even though they came from the same set of parents? That's because parents each have two sets of genes and only passes down half of them at conception. The combination of genes from the two parents can create either very similar or very individuals, or somewhere in between. So this brings us to two concepts, genotype and phenotype. Genotype is that unique genetic blueprint that makes up who you are. Phenotype is what we call the individual's actual observable characteristics. So this means the combination between genes, environment, and the interaction between the two. So nature interacts with nurture, and the expression of that is your phenotype. I don't need to know or go through genetic testing to know what your phenotype is. I can see it. Versus if you wanted to know your actual genotype, you'd have to maybe go through genetic testing. So one of the simplest set of rules that we're going to talk about is the dominant recessive pattern in which a single dominant gene strongly influences the phenotype. Let's go ahead and do that. So take a look at the mother and the father in this picture. They're both phenotypically curly-haired people. But if we look at the description below at their genotype, they each actually contain a straight hair gene and a curly hair gene. So let's look at what impact that has on their children. So in order for their children to have straight hair, because the rule is, the dominant gene always expresses their characteristic, even if you just have one gene. That means the likelihood of them having curly hair children is 75%, because if you have one gene or two genes of curly hair, that's the one that gets expressed. Both recessive gene, 
the straight hair gene in this case, must be present to be able to express their characteristic. So if we go beyond just straight hair, curly hair, but look at blood type and other genetic traits, it is possible to have two dominant genes present as well. So for instance, if a parent gives you a gene for blood type A, the other one gives you a gene for blood type B, both A and B are dominant gene. That way, your blood type is actually AB, and that is said to be a co-dominant. The way to think about homozygous versus heterozygous pair of genes is that homozygous pair of genes, you get the same set of instruction on a location. For instance, if both parents are blood type O versus heterozygous pair in which each parent gives you a little bit different genetic material on the same location. For instance, one is a blood type A, the other one is a blood type O. So to continue our conversation about genetics, we're going to talk about polygenetic in inheritance. We were just talking about hair color or blood type. However, there's many characteristics that are influenced by more than two set of genes. For instance, multiple genes work together to determine a child's height. Skin color is determined by three genes that may blend dark or light color genes depending on who your parents are and the combination that you get from them. Eye color. There's also a variety that could offer multiple color characteristics and possibilities. Multifactorial pattern is referring to the expression of the traits that are influenced by both genes and the environment. Again, so that's that nature interacts with nurture concept. So often when a woman's pregnant, those around her even the woman herself may make predictions about the sex of the baby that she's carrying based on a variety of things, how high or low her belly is, the activity level that the baby exhibits, or any other um, anecdotal um, urban legend, I guess, that you've heard of. However, let's talk more scientifically and empirically about some of the sex differences in prenatal development. Between weeks four and eight of conception, males begin to secrete a hormone called testosterone from their primitive testes. This is necessary to develop male genitalia. A lack of testosterone might quote-unquote demasculinize um, the male embryo to maybe the extent of developing female genitalia. The opposite could happen when a female embryo receives too much hormones um, of testosterone. It might develop male-like genitalia, or even develop those kind of rough-and-tumble male-like characteristics later on. So some of that old wives' tale may be true to a certain extent. Um, prenatal hormones also may influence sex differences in brain development, hormones in adolescent, or even the level of physical aggression, relative dominance of the right or left hemisphere in the brain. So here are a list of sex differences in prenatal development. One thing to note is that boys appear to be more vulnerable to a variety of prenatal problems. And this is a pattern that seems to be consistent throughout life even after birth. One hypothesis is that many problems are recessive. Um, so they're carried on the X chromosome. And because girls have two Xs and boys are XY, therefore giving them only one X, girls have a better chance of having a dominant gene on the other X being expressed versus boys are more like, likely to express phenotypically the recessive gene on their one and only X chromosome. So a variety of problems could occur during pregnancy. For instance, there are two types of genetic disorder that could occur, autosomal disorders or sex-linked disorder. Remember how we talked about we each have 46 chromosomes or 23 pair. The first 22 pairs minus the sex chromosomes are called autosomes. So if the location of the gene that causes a particular disorder is found on one of the first 22 pairs, it's called an autosomal disorder. And here on the slide, you can see some examples of them. 
If it's found on the X chromosome, however, on the 23rd pair, that would make it a sex-linked disorder. What you can see on this slide is many of these disorders follow the dominant recessive gene pattern rule that we previously talked about. If you're interested to learn more about um, the sex-linked and autosomal disorders, um, or chromosomal errors that could happen during pregnancy influencing the fetus, um, please read in your textbook, page 42 to 44. So teratogen is any kind of substance that could cause damage to the growing embryo. The timing of teratogen exposure is crucial. Notice in the graph that teratogens have the most impact during the embryonic stage, except on certain parts of the body, such as the brain and the ears, which continues to be at risk for teratogenic effects because it continues to grow and develop during the fetal period. Each organ system is most vulnerable to harm when it's growing the most rapidly. As you can see in the chart, the first eight weeks can be considered the most dangerous for the majority, if not almost all of the organs. Be sure to be familiar with how specific teratogens such as HIV, alcohol, cocaine, uh, mentioned in the book, impacts the embryo or fetus at the variety of stages. So we just talked about teratogens, its timing, and its possible effects on the growing embryo and fetus um, during pregnancy. Here's a couple of teratogens that may not come up in your radar as teratogens necessarily. Um, let's take a closer look at them. So while prescription drugs are generally not recommended during pregnancy unless the pregnant woman has consulted with her doctor, however, um, if not taken in excess, many of the over-counter drugs, such as acetaminophen, actually would not be harmful to the fetus or baby to take. Again, the keyword is not in excessive, and it's probably best to consult with um, one's physician if um, that was the case. Diet, that's a huge one in pregnancy. Oftentimes, um, you'll see pregnant women getting advice, solicited or unsolicited, from people around her when she's carrying um, a child. So both general adequacy and presence of certain key ingredients are essential in a pregnant woman's diet because it has a huge impact on um, fetal development. Subnutrition, this is when a diet is barely adequate or lacking in certain specific essential ingredients, for instance, folic acids. Folic acid deficiencies can result in neurotube um, defects, which could later result in spinal defida. Malnutrition, this is especially a huge issue in the final three months of prenatal development, so in the last trimester. This is significant because a lack of nutrition at that stage could result in low birth weight for the baby, brain stunting, fetal death, or even longer term um, mental illness in adulthood um, because it affects the developing nervous system in ways that may not be clear to us at that time. Last, poverty. Poverty is a factor in both prenatal and postnatal development, as infants born in poverty are more likely to struggle with lower birth weight and may be less likely to get immunization or receive health care that they need on time. And you can see these individual factors of teratogens may not live in isolation. Someone who live in poor poverty may be more likely to have poor diet because of lack of resources or may lack knowledge about the effects of prescription drugs. So you can see how the buildup of multiple teratogens could really have a detrimental effect on the growing baby before or after pregnancy. So here are two additional resources that I'll also link within your module on Canvas. One is fun facts about Mendel, his peas, and a little bit more about genetics. Um, the second one is a fact sheet about myths and facts about infertility. Since we're talking about conception, prenatal development, um, I just thought this might be a fun additional um, resource um, if you're interested. 
So it's been great having this lecture with you. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know in class or in an email. Hopefully this helps build a foundation for you um, to take your first readiness assessment quiz um, that's also been linked on Canvas. Uh, we'll also follow up in class with an activity to kind of strengthen some of this knowledge that you just gained and apply it in a more real world setting. So look forward to seeing you in class. Take care. See you soon.